Hi, so I'm Dan Hill. Um, I'm actually a machine learning scientist at Amazon.com, uh, but this is not a proxy presentation. Um, this is based on work that I performed uh, when I used to work at Integral Ad Science. So Integral is a startup company based out of Manhattan. Um, they, are, they provide data science support to the uh, online advertising industry. Um, specifically, they focus on display advertising. So these are the sort of rectangular image ads that you see um, embedded on websites throughout the web. And so the, uh, for this uh, particular presentation, I'm going to focus on a project we use to help clients measure the impact of their advertising campaigns. Uh, so just to motivate why this is such an important problem, um, I think many of us are aware that the online advertising is a huge industry right now that's growing very rapidly. Um, in 2015, we're looking at over $150 billion worth of ad spend per year. And so it's absolutely critical that we know, was that, worthwhile, um, was that a worthwhile investment? What is the return on investment of an ad campaign? Now, the sort of gold standard for answering that question would be to do a randomized A-B test. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, A-B tests over the last few days, but unfortunately in online advertising, uh, particularly display advertising, this is relatively rare. And the reason for that is in sort of the details of how uh, an A-B test would work uh, in display advertising. So sort of a schematic here. Um, so a typical A-B test setup is um, you're, you're bidding on an exchange, and if you win the bid, um, you flip a coin and decide, am I going to put the winning... Uh, I'm going to put that particular cookie uh, that I won the uh, display ad bid on, I'm going to put them in treatment or control uh, randomly, um, and then if it's a, uh, a treated individual, they'll get my ad, and if it's a control individual, I'll send them a, uh, a placebo, so typically a public service announcement. Um, however, the, the disadvantage of that system is that you have to pay uh, to place that placebo, right? So you're putting content on a third party's website. They're going to make you pay to put it there. So this makes the test actually rather expensive. And so this is sort of a hard sell to convince a marketer that they should spend 10% um, or ideally 50% of their budget um, performing a test, just throwing that money away on measurement. So in our experiences, this, this doesn't happen very often. Um, in addition, uh, some uh, difficulties are just the uh, coordination, uh, the technical challenge of you're an advertiser, you're working with um, perhaps a dozen different partner publishers who are um, putting ads on many different websites. Uh, controlling them to make sure that you have a consistent test across cookies is, um, is sometimes prohibitive. So what's the alternative? Um, well, if you can't do a test, you could try to do an observational study. You could use the tools of causal inference to try to infer from your big data set uh, what was the actual impact of the ads. Um, this has the advantage of being cheap because it won't require you to um, pay for um, PSA announcements to appear on other people's websites. Um, and it won't require the uh, setting up um, any machinery before you conduct your ad campaign. Um, However, the big problem with this is that it's, it's, this type of analysis is very difficult to do, and this is because of selection bias. So the canonical example of uh, selection bias in advertising is if you type Domino's Pizza into your Google search bar, uh, the very first hit that you'll get is going to be a paid uh, AdWords search, or um, a paid placement for dominoes.com. So um, this is sort of apparent or clearly not very useful um, use of ad budget because anybody who's typing Domino's Pizza into Google.com has probably already made up their mind that they want to go to Domino's, so you shouldn't have to pay um, to put something above the organic result of Domino's.com. Um, so the situation we have here, though, is that the conversion, in this case buying a pizza, is perfectly correlated with getting this uh, search result. right? So when you have a correlation like that, you have what's called confounding. Um, I'm a big fan of causal structural diagrams, so I'll be showing a few throughout the talk. Um, so sort of the basic one that's often used to represent what happens in advertising is that user intent is a confounder or a common cause of both a user receiving an ad and them converting on a campaign. And the reason this happens is because the ad targeters themselves are modeling your user intent, like they're their model of your propensity to convert on this campaign to make decisions about whether to target you. So this creates a large amount of selection bias that you have to correct for. Um, there actually has been some success, um, actually in some previous KDD papers, out of Google and uh, Distillery and other uh, 
uh, advertising company in New York, um, where they were actually able to correct for these confounders, to correct for uh, the selection bias. However, those studies weren't of general usefulness because there are situations where the same organization that is sending the ad is also the one doing the analysis. And um, this is obviously helpful for them because then they will know all of the um, features that they used in, in deciding to send an ad. But as a third party or as the advertiser yourself, um, you would like to be able to still make this calculation, make this measurement, and not just rely on the publisher to self-report. So what we're looking for is an analysis method that a third party can do to monitor the performance of an advertising campaign, and we've basically rolled out normal confounder adjustment and tests. So um, what we found, um, the approach that we took at Integral Ad Science um, was to take advantage of a natural experiment called ad viewability. So it's a fact of display advertising that about half of display ads never get seen by the user that they're sent to. Um, so just as an illustration of this, uh, here's a, imagine a scenario where you're visiting the prestigious Staten, Staten Island Live.com website. Um, the page loads, realize you don't really want to read this article and so you leave, and since you left, um, you never got to scroll down the page and see the uh, ad that Netflix paid for you to see. So that's sort of the most common reason for uh, not having um, an ad be viewable to a, a user, um, just to quantify this a little bit. Uh, this is a heat map of where ads appear within a browser window, um, at least in the data that we collected. Um, so what we have is, you know, the y-axis is uh, vertical pixels along uh, the user's web browser, uh, and then we have the uh, horizontal pixels on the x-axis, and then green represents the probability that an ad appeared there. Uh, the red line is the typical uh, size of a user's web browser in pixels. So you can see there's certainly a very large probability that an ad will appear outside of that um, location. So if, in this cumulative histogram, show less than half of ads actually appear above the fold. And so if users don't scroll, the other half um, don't get seen. Now, there are other reasons why ads don't get seen. Um, it could be that you have multiple tabs open and the ad was actually auto-refreshed in some tab that you're not looking at or your browser or when your browser uh, is minimized. Um, there's also a problem with bots. Um, so bots, uh, bots don't, if you send your ad to a bot, it is not seen. Um, now, the, um, so the advantage that we have at Integral is that for all of these reasons why ads are not seen, um, we had a product where we measured viewability. So this is actually something that we had instrumented. So how can we take advantage of that for this question of measuring the performance of a campaign? So, um, so the viewability of an ad can be thought of as a mediator. It sits in between uh, an ad being served and a user converting. So if you don't have that event that the ad was viewed, we know that the ad is going to be useless. So this is called, um, sometimes referred to as a natural experiment. Uh, Pearl referred to this as the front door criterion. Um, but this is a situation which allows you to have an unconfounded estimate of the effect of ads, even though you don't know the user features, the, you know, the confounding user intent. So uh, just to talk a little bit about our methodology for applying this in our data set, um, what we did was we separated users who received campaign ads into two groups, one where the ad that they received we measured to be viewable, and another group where we um, measured the ad to be unviewable. And if this um, measurement of ad viewability is a, natural, is a true natural experiment, then comparing the two groups should give an unbiased estimate of the performance of the campaign. Um, Oh, and just say the, uh, the data set that we analyze um, came from a set of seven uh, advertised campaigns from fourth quarter 2014 from diverse uh, industries with millions of impressions per campaigns and thousands of conversions per uh, campaign. Okay, so uh, what I'm plotting here is in purple is the results of the viewability analysis. So um, for the seven different campaigns, I'm plotting the estimated lift using that technique. For comparison, I'm plotting the results of a naive analysis. In this case, a naive analysis is not comparing users who had viewable ads versus unviewable ads, but comparing users on our databases that received ads versus those who didn't receive ads. 
Now, you should never do this because we know about selection bias, but it just gives at least a first look at how um, different the estimates are when you use a naive analysis versus this natural experiment. So you go from, this is a logarithmic scale, so you're going from like, clearly gross overestimates of the campaign lift of thousands of percent down to somewhat maybe more realistic looking numbers on the order of 20%. Now, we don't know whether the results I just showed you are like are true est or, um, reflect the true lift of the campaign because we don't have A-B experiments. So what other, um, so we were looking for ways to be able to validate our methodology still without having access to A-B experiments. Uh, and there the solution is what are called negative controls. So a negative control is some irrelevant outcome um, that is one subject to the same confounders as the, um, your original system uh, but two, you know that there's no causal effect of your ads on that outcome. So, for example, if you're running a, um, an advertising campaign for cars, monitoring whether the users buy blue jeans, um, should, you should have no effect on blue jeans by sending them car ads. So if you apply your analysis but then use blue jeans as the outcome, you expect to get a zero lift. And if you don't see a zero lift in your analysis, then um, it's an indicator for bias. Um, so what we did was, for each of our campaigns, selected several other campaigns, for, uh, several other unrelated campaigns, and used their conversions to run the same analysis. Um, and then with the, uh, to test whether or not we actually get the expected zero lift. Uh, and so this is the result. The first column is the uh, true conversion rate uh, um, that we estimated from the viewability analysis, and then the rest of the columns are from different negative controls. And while it's, it's generally uh, favorable that the lift on the campaign that we measured is greater than what we saw in the negative controls, you will see that very few of them are actually um, not statistically different from zero. So what this is an indicator for is that this isn't really a true natural experiment. There must be some other confounding factors that make you having, that after you receive the ad, it being viewable correlated with your purchase behavior. Um, so this adds yet another note to the graph. So now we have a new set of confounders, um, W prime, that um, have causal influence on both viewability and conversion. Although um, the advantage is still that we expect those sort of uh, confounders, which sound a bit obscure, like what, what could possibly correlate the ads being viewable with your, the fact that you buy, to be a lot weaker um, and identi more identifiable than the original confounders um, of whether the ad is served. Uh, so, how much time do I have? Oh, lots of time. So, um, then we needed to identify what these confounders could be. So, we looked at all of the um, all of the metrics that we observe for our users that are at least potentially or plausibly causally connected to both whether your ad is viewable and whether you convert. So, for example, your screen resolution. If you have a very big monitor. Um, you're going to have a lot of pixels. It's likely that more ads are going to appear above the fold, uh, which means your viewability will probably go up. Also, if you have a monitor that big, perhaps you have more disposable, disposable income and you might convert on the campaign. Uh, so we just did a uh, sort of an influence analysis on these different factors. Turned out that the most important one was um, the users, called the user's viewability history, which is just each user seems to have their own prior of how likely it is that they're going to have their ads be viewable. Um, seems to be related to what websites that they choose to uh, browse and also so their, their intrinsic browsing behavior, right? So some users might, on the same website, tend to scroll down all the way through the page while other people jump off uh, um, more rapidly. Um, so we took the uh, significant factors that we identified here and put them into a, a model that we could use to do a, a confounder adjustment. I'm not going to go into the details. It was essentially a, a basic a logistic regression analysis. Um, and here we can see how things changed after the adjustment. So gray is the um, viewability analysis without confounders. Purple is the adjusted version of the analysis. Um, and as we can see, there's a sort of a small impact on the estimated lift for the original campaign. Um, but most of the um, negative controls are now pushed closer to zero with only a couple still being statistically significant. So what this shows is um, one that like, um, adjusting for confounders was successful and that it reduces the amount of uh, bias that we're revealing on negative controls. 
Um, but it shows at least at the time I submitted the paper that we probably hadn't gotten all of the confounders um, identified. Um, but the main point is by, uh, I guess I'll summarize, is that um, we took this problem where we have an incredible amount of selection bias and by using uh, these tools of instrumenting for a mediating variable, of applying negative controls for validation, and by performing confounder adjustment, we're able to get low bias estimates of campaign performance, um, going, you know, starting off with thousands of percent of estimated lift to now uh, on the order of maybe 10% of um, bias given the size of the negative controls. Uh, so we think that this, the lessons we learned are actually generally applicable. Um, we know that like, even though a lot of companies are able to do A-B tests, there are certain scenarios where it's not ethical or not good for um, publicity to actually perform those A-B tests. And so if you need a, uh, an analytical method for doing this, you should, most companies still will be able to identify mediating variables and negative tests. So examples of mediating variables that I think exist at many different companies are um, certainly viewability. You have a news feed. You should be able to track at what point um, uh, which items actually scroll into view. Uh, and on music websites, if you have a shuffled playlist, you know, when the user leaves the playlist is a random event, um, winning a bid at an auction. And I think negative tests are even more um, prevalent in that we spend, we uh, instrument so many features of our users that it's likely that you'll be able to find some irrelevant event that you can use as a control. So uh, that's all I wanted to say, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Daniel. We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Um, thank you. So, so the the problem with uh, non-controlled experiment is always, no matter how well you adjust, people can always point uh, a hole on this study and say, "Hey, guess what? There's only, you know, one of the or two of these negative experiments that you look at, and like, you know, they, they're still very significant, right?" Mm -hmm. So. Um, and um, have you thought about sort of uh, a way that we can maybe bound the uh, the bias? Um, for example, if you can say, hey, you know, I, I know that the bias cannot be over 80%, and, you know, even though I'm adjusting it only for 60% of it, but, you know, it, it's, th there is, you know, a bond that people can, can relate to. Yeah, so the, the difficulty with confounder adjustment is that it's not monotonic. So you can always have, say you're missing two different confounders, and let's say one of them was producing a negative bias and the other one's producing a positive bias, then you actually don't, even though you think you're close to the goal, you don't know whether um, your bias is going to go up or down. So I think if you're in a situation, though, where you know, you have some domain knowledge where you know that um, bias is all going in the same direction, which I think is largely the case in online advertising, where all the biases are pointing towards more ads going to people who are already predisposed to buy, um, then... Like, so in our case, we assume that um, we feel it's likely that our estimates are already upper bounds, right? Because if we're missing confounders, we think that they would all be going in the negative direction, which has been our experience so far. Yes. Yes. Industry segments. So I'm just curious. Like, I mean, I know viewability is not a perfect science. The measuring of it. I'm wondering if there's any correlation between the the kinds of people who have um, systems set up to where viewability is easier to measure but, uh, against the kind of things they're more likely to buy? I think that the, the biggest factors um, are really like what kind of, are really more on the publisher side ultimately, like what websites they choose to go to and like what sort of deals they make. Because like you may have a, a branding campaign, for example, where you want to have the banner ad, right? And those have almost 100% viewability. Right, or but you also may have a different campaign strategy where you hire a publisher who's just trying to get as much reach as possible, so they buy a bunch of low-quality ads, and those tend to be at the bottom of the screen. Um. Well, uh, I think uh, we're running out of time now. Thanks again, Daniel, uh, and. Uh,